Well, good morning, everyone. It is really wonderful to be present here with you. I bring greetings from your brothers and sisters at University Mennonite Church in State College, that strange place name that Wes already referenced, as well as uh, University Baptist and Brethren Church, uh, two Anabaptist congregations that support this Third Way Collective Campus Ministry at Penn State University. And it feels significant to be in a Mennonite and Brethren congregation uh, talking about the campus ministry supported by Mennonites and Brethren in another town, in another place, in another college town. It feels significant to be here with you this morning. It was just over four years ago that my family and I set up for our new home in the so-called Happy Valley of Pennsylvania. We arrived there so that I could help launch Third Way Collective, Penn State's first Anabaptist campus ministry, and as far as we know, the first, camp, uh, first Mennonite campus ministry outside of our five Mennonite colleges and two seminaries here in this country. Upon arriving at this new community, we were pleased to find that there were already people there working at peace and social justice who were passionate about authentically following Jesus, following that work that supports those in the greatest need, to think creatively about justice in their local context, and to create peace in whatever way they can. I grew up in a Mennonite church community in Ontario, Canada, and it's comforting to know that your congregation is already comfortable with obscure Canadian Mennonite humor coming from your pulpit. That <laughs> gives me a deep sense of comfort as I begin the sermon this morning. It was in that Mennonite upbringing that I was introduced to a kind of faith that was centered in the life and the work of Jesus. It was a space where I was encouraged to follow my call to follow my passions, just as long as they centered on building community instead of tearing it down. I moved from Southern Ontario to Eastern Mennonite University in Virginia for college and found an incredible campus there, one committed to peace and justice and international experience. I had my global perspective changed there through cross-cultural experiences in both South Africa and then Israel-Palestine. And then I worked as a, few, uh, as a college recruiter there at EMU for a few years before my wife Meredith and I moved to Southern California so that I could attend Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena. It was in that weird Los Angeles County collision of cultures, building on what my home community had taught me, what EMU had taught me, that I became convinced that there was a need to be working to create spaces in our world that centered on conversation and community rather than the American ideals that we're often told about. Living individual lives that push us towards these socially, economically, and politically divided spaces that we're living into right now. During that time at seminary, I ended up doing an internship at Occidental College in Los Angeles as a campus chaplain. And in that space, I was reminded just of how uh, meaningful college can be. The first few years that we're away from home offer students the chance to explore their sense of self, to wrestle with what they believe, to imagine what their life will look like after college. After seminary, I spent three years as the pastor for youth and young adults at a Mennonite church near Philadelphia, before learning that there was a Mennonite church in State College that was dreaming of a campus ministry alternative. I did a bit of research and found out that the folks at University of Mennonite had noticed that while there were more than 60 campus ministries at Penn State talking about faith, none of them were really focusing on peace and social justice. While they had many organizations focusing on peace and social justice, none of them drew out the faith identity. In fact, most students felt like they were presented with a choice. They had to either commit to the faith tradition that they grew up in or the faith tradition that they claimed as a high school student or reject that and become a person who cares about peace and social justice. They didn't have a choice to do both. And so I was hired with this challenge then, to try and create something that gives space to both of those identities. So in the fall of 2014, Third Way Collective was born, Penn State's very first student organization committed to creating spaces for peace, justice, and faith. Our hope from day one has been that we are providing a third way to hold those two identities. We're committing ourselves to peace and justice, but also to our faith traditions. We believe our unique peace tradition provides a foundation for students to explore.
explore, apply, and reflect on how peace, justice, and faith connect in their daily lives. We chose to center the direction of Third Way Collective in the life of Jesus Christ, but our intent from day one has been to be open and engaging to students from any faith tradition. In fact, our students primarily come from traditions beyond Mennonites and Brethren. They come to us because their tradition is not providing them with a space to engage peace and social justice issues. It seems especially relevant to me at this moment in our nation's history. In the wake of yet another mass shooting, this time at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, we need to be thinking about ways to reach beyond ourselves. We need to imagine a world where greater awareness and attention is given to injustice, to marginalization, and to the violence present in our communities and in our culture. John Roth, a history professor at Goshen College, has this incredible story about the paths that we might choose for ourselves. He recounts a late night train ride when he was traveling abroad in Germany. And in the empty train car, he noticed an older man sitting off to the side uh, who looked dirty, tired, possibly homeless. His mental state didn't seem all that put together either. Now, one of the stops, a group of teenagers boarded that empty car and noticed the old man immediately. They began teasing and taunting him, hurling insults. One picked up a half empty bottle of beer and shook it up and sprayed it on the old man. They began to kick and to punch him, and John was stunned. He couldn't believe what he was seeing, and he had no idea how to respond. He'd been raised a pacifist. He knew inherently, deep down inside, that violence was not the answer. Yet here was a person in need of physical safety and protection. John also was aware that he was probably not capable of intervening when he was badly outnumbered. He had no training in self-defense, He'd never had to defend himself using physical action. He also knew he could not just sit back and do nothing. So he stood up, took a deep breath, said a little prayer, and walked over. He began shouting, Hans, Hans, my old friend, it's been so long. Please, come sit next to me. We have a lot to catch up on. And it caught those teenagers by surprise. John wrapped the man in an embrace and pulled him over to his corner of the train car. At the next stop, the teens just walked away. They left the car. With God's help, John had been shown a third way, one that was neither aggressively violent nor passively non-confrontational. It engaged the real world in practical ways. It was inspired by his faith tradition, but required an imagination for a new direction. I think stories like these are why we continue to believe in the importance of following Jesus. It's why we believe, even in a world that looks so messed up, that there have got to be third-way solutions out there that are transformative. Yeah. It's a really important reminder for us at this time, when we experience so much polarization, at least in the way that it's presented to us by news outlets. Some of you probably struggle, as I do, with this question of why we continue to follow Jesus. I think those who stick with their faith traditions say that they continue going or tending or belonging because they find a sense of meaning or purpose there. We all want to belong, after all. When we belong to a gathering of people who believe the call of Jesus makes a difference in their lives, I think that's incredibly powerful. And the downside of that, of course, is that if you have this participation in organized religion, that doesn't necessarily offer anything redemptive, that doesn't offer anything transformative, that feels like a loss. Today is Reformation Sunday on the church calendar, a day that marks the occasion in 1517 when Martin Luther posted his 95 Thesis on the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. It also marked a paradigm shift in the church at that time, a moment which reverted back to Christ's calling to be more practical with our faith. As people from the Peace Church tradition, we remember that the founders of the Anabaptist movement went one step further, denouncing the political church-state institutions, rejecting infant baptism, and incorporating core Jesus principles such as peace and love for enemies in what they were doing. Several months ago, someone was lamenting to me that while they appreciate our Peace Church tradition, We've done a good job of raising a generation committed to peace and justice, but one that has no desire to stay committed to the church. 
And this person complained that Yummy Bells of today just don't show up on Sunday mornings. And at first, I found myself nodding in agreement. After all, my work, Third Way Collective, was launched by University Mennonite Church, at least in part because for a university church, they didn't have any young people in it. They wanted to reclaim some of that identity. They also recognized that 9.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning doesn't necessarily jive with the college student's schedule. So I got what he was saying. Why can't we get more young people in our church buildings? But I also wanted to push back on the sentiment that says church participation is somehow more important than a life devoted to peace and justice. In many ways, I see young adults committed to peace and justice as living out Christ's calling. I'd rather see that in some sense than churches packed with young adults who are not creating a better world in which they live. See, I, I believe that God has the power to transform our lives and to point us towards peace and justice for all. But I also believe that living a life devoted to justice and peace ends up pointing us right back to God. When we pursue peace and justice, we're joining God's movement in the world, whether we claim a belief in God or not. And I think a little less blind religious devotion, the kind that does not bring freedom to the oppressed, love to the marginalized, is in, in dire need right now. Our churches have historically provided a chance to find communion and connectivity. But if our faith communities become too inwardly focused, instead of looking beyond their walls, haven't we missed the point of why we follow The gospel passage that was read for us this morning from Luke has this great story. It illuminates Jesus, one of his very first callings out into the world. By this point in his ministry, he has a small group of followers, and he tells them not to go out and convert, but to go out and visit the places that he intends to travel. They're not being sent out to proselytize. They're not being sent out to fight with people. They're not being sent out to argue their point and make sure that everyone understands where the truth is coming from. They're sent out to just be, to go out and meet people where they live, to eat and drink with them and bring a message of peace. In this moment, Jesus does not demand that his followers recruit more people to the movement. He's not suggesting that if they're not warmly received, uh, he is suggesting that if they're not warmly received, they just simply need to shake the dust off their feet and move on to the next place. It's a sending call born out of a need to relate and connect rather than to convert. It creates an interesting early precedent in the Jesus movement that elevates connection and elevates dialogue over doctrinal agreement. Jesus is implying in this story that getting to know your neighbors is more important than forcing them to adopt your theological stance. Unfortunately, I think the church has spent most of the past 2,000 years doing just the opposite. Instead of developing deeper relationships with people with whom we disagree, we build churches and religious centers meant to define our differences. We, incre we spend incredible amounts of financial power and social power and critical energy dreaming up ways to convince others that we are right and you are wrong and you need to believe as we do. We even go to war with religious ideology. Even the Reformation, a movement that we're celebrating this morning, is seen as a, a liberation for some, but it also led to persecution for others. It created walls and divisions, probably more than it intended to initially do. Our institutions often seem intent on convincing the world that in order to find God, you have to come to a specific building on a specific time on a Sunday morning, rather than creating communities which point people to God, wherever they happen to be. As I continue my work with young adults on Penn State's campus, I'm reminded that fundamentalist and exclusionary religious movements have done so much more damage than they ever intended. Recent Pew Research studies show that one in four adults between 18 and 25 now have no religious affiliation, and I think that number continues to rise. That's probably an old statistic. The Barna Group, which is a church research center, reports many young adults see churches with uh, using these words, overprotective, homophobic, unscientific, judgmental, and exclusionary. Those are the things that come to their mind initially when they think about church communities. In State College, I'm surrounded by a huge population, just as you are here in Morgantown. 
Penn State is one of the largest interfaith spiritual centers in the country. 60 plus, 60 plus faith groups on our campus. And yet these groups often struggle to convince students of the value of religious experience and affiliation. Now I wonder how much of it is because of our history. And I wonder what would happen if more of those groups would hearken back to this calling from Jesus to go out into the world, to eat and drink with those who we disagree with, to bring a message of peace. How many of those historic conflicts and tensions could have been avoided with this simple sending call? This political moment that we're living through has given rise again to politicians who often lack tolerance, understanding, and empathy. Campaigns feed off of our cultural fear and our cultural self-interest, rather than a greater good or a commonality. Just this past week, the news of a massive group of refugees making their way to our border has been used as fuel from parties on both the left and the right. And it's, at, it's, it's told us again that we are not safe here, that we need to build a wall, that we need to beef up our security. We have had the same challenges on our college campuses. During the last presidential campaign season, our free speech zones at Penn State were filled with shouting matches between the different political groups on our campus. Even young people do not agree on the direction of our, our country, and many have reverted to anger and aggression. One student went so far as to build an actual wall around a group of organizers. Is it any wonder, given what our campaigns modeled for us? I expect the same is true here in your community as well. So those of us who work or live or are part of these religious institutions may be better served by advocating for conversation and connection rather than conviction. And I wonder if creating spaces for doubt, and disagreement, and dialogue are might maybe more important than a system that has leaned towards hardline doctrine. Third Way Collective specifically, this campus ministry, we continue to dream about ways for students who are searching for an alternative to find meaning and to find value. We're trying to position ourselves to create spaces for students at a crossroads, providing them a different way to belong. Some of our dreams are things that we're taking on right now, like creating spaces for conversation each week around a specific issue or topic, or things that are going on in students' lives. We've created a podcast we call Peace Signs, in which we highlight short stories of peace, justice, and faith in our community. We meet with people who are interested in forming relationships around a whole host of issues and topics. We've partnered with groups like Students for Justice in Palestine, International Justice Mission, Eco Action, a host of others. We've been excited that there are people like the folks here at Mordecai Church of the Brethren who see the importance in creating spaces for peace, justice, and faith to coexist in their community. We joined with some others a few years ago in the wake of the violence in Ferguson, Missouri to launch Campus and Community in Unity, a group working to combat racism and celebrate the diversity of our small town. We helped to form a group in our community that works at overcoming grief and loss called Learning to Live, What's Your Story? We've collaborated with other affirming ministries to create Receiving with Thanksgiving, Penn State's first LGBTQ Christian network for students who feel like they're also given this false dichotomy to choose between their sexuality or their gender identity and their faith. Our student leaders helped to launch the first ever International Day of Peace March on our campus a few years ago. And last spring, we held the third annual Palm Sunday Peace Walk in State College, highlighting people of faith who are working for good in our community. We've used our voice on campus to bring people with Peace Church connections to our community, such as hosting Raw Tools, an organization that takes guns off the streets and using blacksmith equipment transforms them into garden tools in a sort of modern-day interpretation of the swords of the plowshares passage. We've invited folks like Drew Hart to speak about racial justice and inclusion in church spaces, and have brought Ted and Company to our campus several times to speak about peace through theatrical performances. Some of our dreams with Third Way Collective are bigger and more than we are able to undertake at this time, <laughs> such as look, looking at starting an intentional living community centered around peace and justice and faith, or creating a local peace resource center in our community. We're possibly one day creating 
a peace studies course or minor uh, as an educational aspect of our influence on campus. This fall, we're trying to more fully live into it being a ministry of presence rather than one that's just about programming. We looked back and noticed that in the first four years that we existed at Penn State, we collaborated or created more than 400 different campus and community events. Maintaining that busyness, though, means that we often cannot respond to things like the violence that happened yesterday in Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh. Scaling back our programming this fall has meant that we are more able to quickly respond and walk with students who are standing up for things like immigrant uh, safety and justice, uh, LGBT students seeking affirmation, survivors of sexual violence and assault, students of color who are in need of allies. And it leads to ripples of change. I referenced that we helped start receiving a Thanksgiving and LGBT Christian network. Um, tragically, one of those students took their own life in the first year of that organization. But the family reached out to me and said, our child did not have a faith community that affirmed him. Would you please officiate at um, the funeral? Uh, another group of uh, young adults heard about my participation and passed on the message to two young women in a neighboring town who could not find a pastor willing to officiate at their wedding ceremony. And they didn't know what Mennonites were, but they were willing to sort of put up with this strange person because I was willing to go into spaces that others were not. It's led to things like a transgender clothing exchange program and clothing closet on our campus um, for students in need who are in the midst of their transition. Uh, a student reached out to me and asked me to officiate at a transgender renaming ceremony a few uh, months ago. These are things that I could not have anticipated. It's because we slowed down. It's because we chose to be present with others, just as Christ asked his followers, instead of trying to convince them that we were right and they were wrong. I think part of finding third way solutions is to figure out how to discern when to move on, how to discern when to shake the dust from our feet if things aren't going well as we planned. But we have to continue to remind ourselves of stories like these, of stories like this passage from Luke, because I think it allows us to be better people in the world. I'm certainly better to be a better parent and spouse when I slow down to offer myself more self-care as part of a holistic experience of my vocation. And it allows me to pause before my theology and politics become too aggressive with the people I'm interacting with. Like Christ's sending call to the disciples to go and prepare a way, we know that we were a part, we are a part, of a larger network of disciples working at that very same thing, to creatively find third-way solutions in our world. Third Way Collective is fortunate to have been empowered by a few churches in our local context, beyond University Mennonite Church, our founding congregation, who have reached out in support of this ministry. And it gives me hope knowing that there are congregations like yours, who believe in what we are doing, who see us as their partners in God's movement out, of, out, uh, out into the world to offer peace. It is great to be with you all here this morning. I'm guessing that there are ways we can learn from each other, being people of peace in, college, in large college towns, imagining ways to help empower each other in our local contexts and with our presence. Thank you for your prayers of support. I know we have the capacity to join the Spirit's movement in the world that is happening, whether we choose to follow it or not. The harvest is plentiful, my friends, but the laborers are few. Yet we continue to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Through it all, we know that we must offer space for people to belong and to join God's movement in the world. Many blessings to you, Morgantown Church of the Brethren, on the road ahead. Peace be with you all.